I hope you do not see this as a dry academic lecture on finance. It really isn't. We recognize that value investing is more of an art than a science. The stock market essentially is a mirror of society. Today, we call ourselves buy right, sit by, blend in. That's our theory now. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be given this opportunity to talk about value investing, which has been a, a passion for me for almost like 40 years of my life already. Yeah, and so I'm very grateful to Chinese University, to Professor Terence Chong for giving me the opportunity, uh, to Mr. Yen Ting Hin uh, for helping to make this possible. And uh, also a very special note of thanks to my old friend, uh, Mr. Richard Lawrence, who is the founder and the head of Overlook, which is actually the sponsor of this event. Uh, I'm very honored to be following Mr. Richard Lawrence to give this uh, lecture series. Richard spoke here, I think, uh, one week ago. And I can tell you, you should really listen carefully to his uh, lecture. He's the gold standard for asset management in the world. Uh, with Richard Lawrence, uh, you don't just uh, subscribe to his fund. You have to queue up and be selected by him to be able to have the privilege to join his fund. That's how good, how high the standards are. And then before I go on, I also want to say quickly that uh, I hope you do not see this as some kind of a dry academic lecture on finance. It really isn't. Uh, value investing is very well connected to the real world, the production of goods and services to raise the living standards of our people. Why I say that is that value, value investing is a vital uh, role in the, the stock market in recognizing superior companies, companies and entrepreneurs who deserve uh, investment. Because what it is is that value investing tries to find the best companies and channel the savings of our society, the savings of our people into the most productive enterprises. So that's the connect with the real world. Uh, it's a vital part of our asset allocation process that channels savings to investment in the best way possible. Now, before I proceed with the formal uh, lecture itself, I think I owe you uh, a brief introduction to my firm, uh, Value Partners, uh, whose slogan, by the way, is uh, investing through discipline. And as we go along this afternoon, my, uh, my talk will last perhaps 30 to 40 minutes. You will find out what I mean by investing through discipline. So for Value Partners, uh, we have been uh, in business for almost 30 years. And uh, we are basically have the mission of carrying out traditional value investing by which, which we define the mean buying the three R's. You will see here, buying the right business run by the right people at the right price. Uh, and as we have been in, around for 30 years, uh, we also recognize that value investing is more of an art than a science. Uh, it evolves and it must blend into a, uh, a very rapidly changing uh, environment. So uh, the three hours of value investing remains the same for me, but the way it's executed is a work in progress. It's evolving uh, as the environment itself changes. Uh, value Partners was the first company of its kind to be listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. We were floated on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in uh, late 2007, and today, we are one of Asia's biggest uh, independent asset manage managers. Actually, our assets under management now is close to 1.5 billion US, 15 billion US. And uh, internally, we call ourselves a temple, a temple of value investing, because we feel that this particular approach to uh, uh, investing money to, in uh, managing and looking after the savings of people really is a, almost a passion, almost a religious passion. We, it's not just a job. If you think of it as a job, you will not last for very long in a company like Overlook or like Value Partners. Uh, currently, we have a team of uh, 200 people on our staff, of whom 80 people are investment professionals. And they do a lot of uh, bottom-up research, roughly 7,000 company visits a year. During COVID, we have not been able to do visits 
but we work through the phone and by Zoom and other, other means. It's a lot of work. Uh, the company is probably the one that is most recognized in Hong Kong's uh, Hong Kong brand independent SMH in industry. Uh, we have received actually more than 250 awards, 250 uh, since we started uh, almost 30 years ago. Okay, now we move on to the, to the uh, main point of this uh, discussion, which is uh, what are we doing? What is value investing? How does it work? What are the strong and the weak points? The first step we need to do is that we need to figure out what we mean by making money from buying stocks. What are the components of return? There are actually only three components. The first is uh, earnings per share increase. So you really want to buy companies where uh, the earnings, the profits are growing and divided by the number of shares outstanding, the earnings per share is growing. That's the first big component. The second is the dividend yield offered by the company. In Hong Kong, uh, dividend yield is tax-free. So if a company has, uh, for example, 2.5% dividend yield, it comes right into your pocket. The third one is an interesting concept. It is uh, the valuation of the stock itself. How much investors are willing to pay to own the, the, the stock. Uh, in other words, the price earnings ratio. Let's look quickly at what it means. Before, uh, I'll just cut right to the point, which is that of the three components of return today, in recent years, the most important component is the price earnings ratio, the valuation, uh, i.e. if uh, investors are willing to pay more to own the stock, that's where you get a lot of the share price increase. Uh, in this illustra simple illustration, uh, a stock that trades at uh, eight times PE, if it can be re-rated, investors are willing to pay 12 times PE. The share price will have to go up by 50%, 50%. That's a lot more interesting than uh, relying on earnings per share growth, which is today's market average is typically 5 to 10% only, and dividend yield, which is only 1 to 1.25%. Uh, uh, there's a bit of history here. I think throughout the 1990s, value partners didn't really look too much at price earnings ratio because it was very stable. At that time, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index only had 33 stocks inside. And uh, the price earnings ratio uh, for most of those years, not all of them, was fairly consistent, roughly 10 to 12 times earnings. So we rely on the earnings per share increase. Those are the boom years of Hong Kong economy. The, uh, so earnings per share tend to follow the overall economic growth. And uh, we were able to find companies generally with stable earnings uh, per share increases of 12% roughly. I remember that clearly. And dividend yield of roughly 5%. So 12 plus 5 is 17. So you will see remarkably that our portfolio in those days, uh, that asset value of the portfolio tended to increase by roughly 15 to 17% a year, very consistent. This trend only began to, began to, en to end uh, in the early years of the 21st century when the market situation began to change. And we ourselves then evolved to follow an emphasis on price earnings multiple. But before we go on, just to remind you that price earnings multiple uh, can also decrease, not just increase, and that can really kill you regardless of whether you're buying uh, stocks with earnings or no earnings. Uh, a PE multiple D rating from 12 to 8 works in the opposite direction. You are immediately down a, a lot of money. Yeah, about one third. Yeah. Anyway, because this uh, concept of uh, emphasizing the PE multiple or the price earnings ratio is so important, I better define it very clearly before we, we move on. So this measures the share price relative to the earnings per share. And uh, it shows how much investors are willing to pay per dollar earnings. So the formula is right there. Simply divide the share price by earnings per share and uh, you, you have the PE. Uh, this is the simple way, of course. There, there are very elaborate ways of uh, making this more meaningful, including working out the average PE, the adjusted PE, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in general, it's the same. Uh, I think, for example, at the moment, uh, the PE of the total Hong Kong market, all stocks in Hong Kong market on average is about 15, 1, 5. 
that's, that means investors are willing to pay 15 times earnings to buy Hong Kong listed shares. Now, so you might say, why not just buy a low PE stock, the cheap stock? Uh, but the problem is, what is cheap may stay cheap. It may actually indicate an inferior business, uh, especially since the uh, global financial crisis of 2008. There has been abundant and excess liquidity in, uh, in the capital markets. So there's no shortage of capital to buy stocks. And if people still want to avoid the stock, it's still very cheap. It may suggest that something is wrong with it. And then to summarize the concept uh, in a very simple way, if you are buying stocks today, what are you really looking for? You're actually looking for three things. You're looking for, if possible, high growth in earnings per share. Uh, if all else being equal, 20% growth in earnings per share means 20% increase in your share price. Yeah. You're looking for high dividend, all else being equal. 5% dividend yield means 5% return to you, the investor, if nothing else changes. But most importantly for me, increase in the price earnings ratio in the multiple people are willing to pay. That is the real driver now in today's market of uh, share price returns. Uh, so if we say, for example, last year, our uh, classic fund recorded a gain. Uh, I can't remember clearly what was it. It was 34%, eh? about, eh? Yeah, last year, our classic fund recorded a gain of 34 or 35%. And uh, a large part of that didn't come from uh, earnings per share increase or dividend yield, obviously, because you remember last year's very bad COVID uh, situation. The economy was pretty flat and in, in recession. Last year, this 34% gain that we were able to deliver to our clients entirely came from increasing the price earnings multiple. That's how powerful that is. So we picked the right stocks that had the ability to be re-rated by the investment community. Now, it's easier said than done because if everyone knows how to do it, people like me and my team probably have, will be out of a job. So let's figure out how you look for factors that can drive up PER. The gist of it is uh, catalyst investing. The English word catalyst means something that will cause something else to happen they will stimulate or they will be the trigger point, will trigger certain changes. That's a catalyst. Uh, I think those of you who study ke chemistry know it by a very specific meaning. Uh, something that when added to a given situation creates a reaction that is very interesting. Uh, so what you really need, you are looking for a PE, uh, multiple re-rating, you just ask yourself, what can produce a re-rating of the market? or the PE ratio. And also the other side of the coin is that you also want to be careful in case there are negative catalysts that can actually cause the PE multiple to drop, not to increase. And that can really kill your portfolio. That can happen in uh, various different ways. And of course, many of us, including me, we have also experienced some very strong setbacks in the market, very, uh, very demoralizing and discouraging losses. A lot of that is not caused by sudden earnings drop. It's because investors are running away and the PE multiple drops a lot. So you also really need to watch out for negative catalysts. Now, in searching for catalysts, there are a number of elements. Uh, the first thing to note is that it's all, a lot of it has to do with finding things that surprise the market, surprise investors positively, beating expectations. Uh, because the stock market is uh, sometimes we call it in finance a discounting machine. The stock market looks to the future. Things that are already known, that you already read about in the newspaper, are already mostly priced. In. It's really in share prices. So you are looking for something that people don't really expect. And that is, uh, in many ways, not the only way, but the, in many ways, that is the essence of finding positive catalysts, beating people's expectations. And also, of course, uh, to some extent, the work we do uh, is not just due to uh, our own research, of course. Uh, it's also benefiting from a very positive overall environment. Uh, like, for example, the current environment characterized by super low interest rates. If you take away inflation, interest rates are currently negative in many parts of the world. So there's abundant liquidity, uh, abundant uh, 
I would say, uh, willingness of investors to put money to work in stocks, that is a favorable environment that can exceed what was expected. As recently as uh, March 2020, many professional investors, including me, did not expect the, the abundant liquidity and the, uh, the sheer amount of stimulus to produce such a favorable macroeconomic environment. So that too is a surprise, yeah. But always be warned, it can work in the opposite direction. Overall, I will say this. Overall, I will say that uh, one of the first things I, I learned as a young man about the stock market, at that time, I wasn't even a, a fund manager. I was actually working as a financial journalist at that time in the uh, Asian Wall Street Journal, was the stock market essentially is a mirror of society. It's like a mirror. You, when you look at a mirror, uh, you see all the hopes and the fears of the society reflected in their behavior or share prices. So you are looking for positive catalysts that will cause the PE to be rate. You have to keep asking yourself, what will be in the mirror that will make society more hopeful, more optimistic than is currently the case? Uh, that's essentially what happened uh, in the, uh, from uh, April 2020 when society realized that it was far too worried about COVID and the pandemic. And in fact, it should be more hopeful. And so share prices went up actually a lot, yeah. And you should also be asking yourself, what are the fears of the society that may increase, that may make it uh, people want to dump stocks and run away? Uh, the market is a mirror. They will reflect all these hopes and fears, both today's hopes and fears and tomorrow's hopes and fears. You had to try to anticipate it. So possible catalysts, uh, this is not a complete list, but these are just some well-known ones, including a uh, macro environment that turned out to be a lot better than expected. Uh, the truth is people like me who have been in the market a long time have been uh, very worried about the stock market since 2008, about the society, the economy, the stock market, all this high debt, uh, high borrowing costs, social uh, tension, uh, uh, excessive money printing, but the macro environment continues to surprise in the upside. For example, today, uh, recently, uh, treasury bond yields went up and the market dropped a bit. There was a setback. But sure enough, by yesterday, people are talking about YCC, yield curve control. People are speculating that if treasury yields go up too much, the Federal Reserve and other central banks would impose controls on how much Treasury yields are allowed to go up. And this has encouraged investors all over again. It's obvious that the authorities are totally committed to an environment where uh, financial assets are not allowed to crash, not at the moment anyway. Yeah. So that's a kind of macro environment that is very encouraging for stock market investors, rightly or wrongly. Another potential catalyst are those who practice uh, growth investors they have had a very good time in recent years where they really find businesses that are, have very superior growth rates. Companies, I think last week, I listened to a lecture by Mr. Lawrence. He talked about great companies like, for example, PSMC, where the growth rates are obviously one of the highest in the world on a sustainable basis and without undue resort to heavy borrowing. Now, that's a kind of superior business that, uh, People, you can identify it and you're ahead of the crowd. You can, um, I was calling milk the cow, we say many, many times. This is a cow that keeps giving you milk year after year. You know? And by the way, I'm one of those who don't really believe there's such a thing as growth investing versus value investing. I think they're just terms people use. To me, great value investing incorporates many of the elements of growth investing and great growth investing incorporates many of the key ideas of value investing. The two are joined together at the hip. Here are other uh, potential catalysts, including uh, market timing. Uh, it can be uh, technical analysis. It can be charting. I, I, I have some friends in uh, Southeast Asia and Hong Kong who even believe in using feng shui or astrology. I'm not saying they are valid or not. I think if you are very good at, at what you do, you can make money through different methods. And I had no bias against people who use investment methods different from mine. Yeah, that is like the way I think God has created our world. Many different kinds of living beings can 
coexist together. This is definitely true of the stock market. Yeah. Now, there's one activity, however, that you should never ever do because you'll destroy your brand. And without brand, without personal reputation, you cannot have a career in our industry. And there's uh, illegal forms of trying to gain an advantage in the stock market, such as uh, inside info, insider trading, front running, market manipulation. In Hong Kong, such activities are actually criminal. You could actually end up in jail. But even if that's not the case, uh, it's inadvisable because finance is based on reputation, on how clean your hands are. And you don't want to destroy your reputation for the sake of uh, one or two profitable deals. Yeah, highly discouraged, but we must recognize that these things do happen. And it's one way people try to find a catalyst so that they can uh, gain an increase in the price earnings ratio. Uh, activist investing has been big in the US and other parts of the world, but not so much here in Hong Kong or Asia, which is that you buy the stock and then you go and uh, ask the management to improve the way the company is managed. If necessary, asking for a seat on the board of directors as well. Uh, this method is valid. It works. It can actually encourage the company to be better. But I think Asia, probably we are still in the early days yet because we have pretty much a non-confrontational structure. And also many Asian companies are still shareholder controlled by the original family. So they have full, full control and it's very hard to uh, be too aggressive towards them. Yeah. Of course, by the way, I mustn't forget to mention that since PER re-rating can be a D rating, can work the other way around, they are also specialists in short selling. People who make money by having the stock go down, by anticipating a decline in the share price. Uh, uh, that's another way of saying, uh, by anticipating the PE will drop, not increase. One uh, investment approach in terms of uh, catalyst uh, investing, that has gained great popularity in recent years. It's called thematics. Uh, the idea of identifying themes that are in favor with governments or with markets. Uh, recent examples, in, as you well know, into technology, healthcare, ESG, clean energy, food security. Uh, I think this theme, thematics is here to stay. Uh, I will later explain to you why I think it's here to stay, but safe to say that uh, today, um, Investors are very interested in following major themes that uh, will allow them to gain from an overall re-rating, not of just one or two stocks, but in the entire sector. For example, uh, in uh, the mainland of uh, China, clean energy stocks, solar, wind, have had a tremendous 12 months. Ever since President Xi, Xi Jinping said that China is committed to be carbon neutral, by the year 2060. So, and, and these themes keep moving. So I think at some point, it may even go back to old fashioned assets like deep value stocks or gold, you know? but there are themes running at any given time. I can only add that even if you adopt this approach uh, for themes, you should still do bottom-up research and, and stop picking. Don't, not all, all stocks covered by a particular theme will be good buys. Some are better than others. All the uh, approaches I mentioned, including value investing, have their summers and winters. There'll be times when you, re you really get very discouraged because your approach is simply not effective. Uh, and also many investors, uh, they are using a blend of different styles, ranging from value investing to technical analysis, uh, to uh, even uh, activist investing. On the like, unofficially, we go and see a lot of company managements after we buy the stock to encourage them to improve their corporate, corporate governance, their investor relations, et cetera. That is a form of activist investing too, although it's done in a very uh, soft touch way. Yeah. Uh, but don't expect your style to be all season. It works throughout. There will be bad times and good times. Uh, I, I would say, however, maybe I'm biased that value investing tends to be, uh, have longer summers and shorter winters based on my experience. So today, uh, we, we call ourselves uh, quality value investors. And I'll explain to you. Uh, essentially, the work of a value investor has been uh, evolving. And uh, we put emphasis on a concept called 
quality value. Uh, quality value, uh, remember I, met, I started the discussion by saying that three R's, right business, right people, right price. Uh, in the 1990s, frankly, our focus was on right price, buy cheap stocks. Uh, I think uh, Professor Benjamin Graham used to call it the last part of the, of the cigarette. You, you basically are looking for cigarettes on the, on the street uh, where people haven't actually finished smoking yet. There's one last part left. You pick up and smoke it for free. Uh, so that's cheap price investing. But today, our emphasis is more on the uh, right people and, and, and right business, not right price. Right price has lost a lot of effectiveness for various reasons. I mentioned to you abundant liquidity. The, the, the problem today is not shortage of money. The problem today is shortage of good businesses to buy. Yeah. But another problem with the right price approach is that uh, when I started in this game in the 1990s, uh, having a CFA was a big deal. So people like me who were taking the trouble to uh, learn how to analyze numbers and formulas and ratios, we had real advantage. But today, many people have the same knowledge. You just have to buy a book, go to the internet, and you learn how to do all this uh, ratio analysis, uh, number analysis, uh, data analysis. So the guys like me from the 1990s who know a lot about number analysis no longer have advantage. Everyone knows more or less the same trick. So today you have to switch your competitive advantage to a different kind of advantage, which is uh, finding good businesses with good people. Businesses that have what uh, I think Warren Buffett has called before, durable advantages. That means they have competitive advantage lasting a long, long time. They're sustainable. And uh, you have to find catalysts that can drive the price earnings ratio. And of course, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, watch out for negative catalysts. So it's very challenging. I will discuss now how this quality value investing concept uh, actually works, what you need to uh, look out for. You, first of all, you need a very uh, disciplined, very proven uh, process. And uh, it's quite important for you to be constantly uh, in touch with reality. Uh, human beings are very strange. Uh, people, everyone, including me, we are much more subjective than you realize. You think you are in touch with reality. You think you're in touch with the truth. Actually, oftentimes you are not. There is, uh, we, in Value Partners, we used to have a test that essentially trying to uh, show you the, the perception gap between what is real and what you think is real. A lot of work has gone into that. Another useful discipline we try to encourage people to learn is not uh, the standard economics, but behavioral economics, which tries to show that human beings react emotionally and subjectively to many uh, events. Uh, and also to make this work, frankly speaking, you need a great strength of character. Uh, I think one of the questions people often ask me is, uh, when you interview candidates for a job in Value Partners, what are you looking for? In many cases, I'm looking for strength of character. The English term strength of character basically is a hard to explain. It means that this guy is a strong character. He has the uh, willpower to climb tall mountains, uh, even when the weather is very bad. Yeah, that kind of character. This is a guy with great courage, determination. He delivers, he's reliable, and uh, when he's convinced of the truth, he dares to stick to it, even when many people give up. Uh, now, this is a very idealistic uh, description. None of us can live up to such a high standard, but we must try. Uh, and value investing is very strongly related to strength of character. Anyway, uh, I gave this same lecture some years ago in Columbia University, uh, which is that we try to be a little bit more scientific. So we try to break down the value investing process into separate steps. Separate, if, if value partners is a factory, these are the different processes involved to manufacture the product in the factory. If this is a chocolate fact kitchen, these are different processes involved to make the chocolate to the final product. So I will briefly go through. Uh, so the first step is uh, originating the idea. Originating idea means finding uh, the pool of ideas that you want to do more research on. Very often, the idea pool, uh, in our case, we become a large company. So we basically screen the entire market. Uh, 
the entire market for us, including mainland China, East and Southeast Asia, and Hong Kong, comprises about six to 8,000 companies. We screen them all. But if you are not value partners, you're a smaller team, you probably want to try ideas that are a bit contrarian, contrary to. So try to find companies that people think are not very good, but which has a chance to be very good. That's why you get a P multiple of a rating. Try to identify uh, ideas and situations which are out of favor or not so popular and see whether you can uh, achieve a, uh, a perception gap. That means the reality is that the company is much better than people realize. Think about finding a company like TSMC in the 1990s uh, when it was just a, really a, a nothing Taiwan company, that kind of thing. The second step is the research. Research is a very important part of our process. Later, if time allows, I hope to introduce you to standard textbooks we use. But uh, I think, for example, I'm sure uh, Professor Terence Chong and his team are teaching you very uh, good techniques uh, based on well-known concepts of uh, research. Uh, we have invented nothing new in research. We used to follow a textbook called Securities Analysis by Graham and Dodd. But uh, sometime in the late 1990s, we changed to a much easier book called Financial Security Analysis by Martin Fritzson. These are very standard textbooks on uh, analyzing balance sheets, ratios, and numbers. Uh, but just so you know, in my company, we have 80, 80, 80 people just doing research. So it really is a lot of work and we believe in bottom-up investing. So we visit a lot of companies to find out what is really happening on the ground level. That approach, by the way, the two concepts, one is called kick the tires. There's a, always a joke in many countries that you buy a second-hand car, you must kick the tires to see whether the car collapses or not before you buy the car. The second approach we have is called walk the extra mile. If you think that uh, your competitors, analysts are covering the company, you try to spend half a day more than they do in the hope that your half a day will give you an advantage. Uh, research is something I enjoy, it's my core competence, and uh, I love reading, uh, analyzing, facts and figures, etc. The third skill you need to make the chocolate is decision making. That is uh, difficult to teach, and is very strongly related to strength of character. I have known many good research analysts who cannot execute. You know, so they are the kind of guys who I call them they are waving a knife, but they did not stick it into. They, they don't have the killer instinct. So in uh, Value Partners, we, are, we teach our young people, kill. You are paid to be a killer. You must kill. If we have a great idea, we don't mind putting in 10% of the entire fund into this one idea and sticking with it. Uh, making decisions is one of the uh, most rare of human skills. Most people would like to be neutral and not get blamed for anything. And uh, one reason why I am uh, able to uh, uh, start a, a company like Value Partners and still survive after almost 30 years of work is that I am not afraid to make decisions. I make decisions very quickly. I accept that I will make a lot of mistakes, no problem. I don't look back and I go on a bit. Yeah, if you can just train yourself to be a decisive human being uh, and uh, accept the consequences of your decision, you are already 30% uh, on the way to becoming a good professional investor. The fourth skill is quite technical, it's uh, deal structuring. Uh, deal structuring is that we found that the capital market has become so complicated that before you uh, become a part owner of a business, before you buy the securities, you should look at uh, how to structure the deal that is most advantageous to your clients. So it can be buying the stock, it can be buying the uh, convertible bonds, it can be buying the debt, uh, it can be various forms of uh, structuring process that gives you a small advantage. Uh, there are even people who found that by being uh, a microsecond quicker to place a buy or sell order, they can also get an advantage. Yeah, deal structuring is covering these very technical aspects of, uh, of the financial uh, uh, infrastructure. Now, execution today is no, long, no longer done by my fund managers or analysts. It's done by a, a professional team of dealers. Uh, unfortunately, in today's world, it's much more difficult for young people to go through the kind of training I receive when I not only have to do the research, make the decision, 
and structure the deal. I had to execute it myself by directly phoning up the broker or the, uh, the intermediaries to get a deal done. Today, because of compliance and because of specialization of roles, uh, in big companies, dealing is done by a specialized team of dealers who have their own way of trying to uh, get the best possible price. Uh, uh, it's hard to explain. What is the average price for a trading day? Let me ask you. The average trading price is the total volume of trading divided by the number of shares traded. If you end up the day getting a price worse than this, your dealing was bad or you make the wrong decision. Yeah. Okay. So the, the execution. Now, deal maintenance is something I myself am not very good at because I tend to lack patience. But after you buy the stock, please don't forget about it. Continue to stay awake, update your research, stay in touch with management, and keep thinking, can I do a better job, uh, et cetera. And the day will come, no matter how much you fall in love with the stock, when you really have to exit. It's time to take your profit or your loss. Uh, Oh, I just noticed my slides included our internal jargon. Uh, we try to make it simple for the beginners. Uh, we simply divide all the stocks we buy and sell into category one, two, three. Category one stocks are undervalued. Category two are fair value. Category three is so overvalued that even taxi drivers will recommend you to buy the stock. So our job is to buy category one and sell at category 2.5 before taxi drivers start recommending. It's easy to say, very hard to do. Uh, at category two, you are beginning to lose your competitive advantage. That means what you know is what other people also know. And people are reading about the buy idea already in the financial media. That means the advantage is already beginning to disappear. You are not the original guy anymore. You are not the guy for whom the catalyst is waiting to happen. The catalyst probably already occurred. So 2.5, bye-bye stock. That can take a few years. Though. Now, key learning tools are very important for us because any one of you who has uh, tried to take up a new skill or profession, whether it is stock market investing, playing golf, playing poker, or learning sailing, would know that there are various teaching tools that your coach should use to get you to visualize what you need to do to get onto it. So for us, uh, important teaching tools include, uh, these words you can't find in dictionary, they were invented by me. Uh, teachability means people who can be taught. About half of human beings, especially as they get older, are not teachable. They already make up their mind a long time ago. So uh, their minds are closed. The windows of their minds are closed. They are not willing to be taught. You can spend the rest of your life trying to teach them something, it is no use. They don't agree with you, they don't want to know. The concept of teachability and learnability is critical to a successful analyst and fund manager. Learnability means you have the ability to learn. I, I believe even though I'm not quite as young as you are, I have great learnability. My mind is always open for fresh learning. Yeah. Key to teachability and learnability is the ability to be very humble. Uh, because you're not humble, you think you're good, you don't learn. Another concept is the my own uh, smart, stupid theory is not here. It's important how you see yourself. I see myself as a very stupid guy because I think I'm stupid. I'm willing to learn. But if I think I'm smart, I will not learn anything because I think I'm really very smart. So the smart, stupid theory has helped me a lot since I was a kid that uh, I always say, oh, I'm too stupid. You had to teach me. That way I learn very fast. Whether or not I'm really stupid, I don't know. But I see myself as stupid. Yeah. It's the same theory as people who have only one eye. Sometimes they see better than people with two eyes because they are very conscious. They only have monovision. So they had to try harder to see things. Yeah. Second is uh, for me, when I do a job, I always try to make a difference. Uh, so in value investing, uh, although we are a Hong Kong company, Hong Kong may not be like a big market like the US or uh, whatever, uh, but we still must make a difference. So in all my work I had done in Hong Kong since coming to Hong Kong, I try to be a pioneer and make a difference in there so that in case I'm fired or I resign, my boss will say, oh my God, the guy has left. It's very hard to replace him. You know, he make a difference here. That's what I'm looking for, make a difference. And uh, also very related to this is the concept of knowing what you don't know. 
I think I have survived in this industry because I'm always aware of what I don't know. You'll be amazed how much I delegate, how much I listen to experts, how much I tell people I have no value added because of my knowledge of Bitcoin or whatever is actually very low. So you guys tell me, you decide. I only know a few things, but these few things are enough to make me quite good in my field. But what I don't know, I tell you up front, I don't know, I leave it to you to decide. That has saved me many times from disaster. Yeah, knowing what I do up front, yeah. Now, for if you want to do, uh, as I mentioned, on an institutional scale, not yourself, you also have very good corporate culture. So in the firm of Value Partners, 200 employees, we make everybody, well, I will say, we invite everybody to volunteer to sign a promise to the company. It's then printed out and put beside their uh, computer terminal. Uh, it's a promise, essentially, of professional excellence and professional integrity. The key point in the promise, in my view, is point number four, to put client interests first. There, when I started Value Partners with my partner, Mr. Vini Ye, in the early 1990s, uh, there was some kind of bias or, or prejudice that financial firms, which are known as fiduciary trust institutions, People trust you with their money. People trust you with their savings. They expect you to be worthy of the trust. There was a very unfortunate perception that uh, it's less likely for a financial institution run by Asian people to be trustworthy because there were so many scandals involving trust in Asian-run financial firms. And I was very determined that we will show that Asian people can also be trusted to run world-class financial companies. So I used to take pictures of my hands, very clean hands. In those days, we use Polaroid camera, instant camera, and we will print the picture in front of every employee's desk so that every day they're reminded their hands must be very clean. I can honestly put my hand on my heart and tell you I'm not corruptible. Yeah. Well, even when I was very poor. Somehow, you know, I, because I feel it's a matter of honor for, uh, well, maybe for Asian people like us or for people in our industry in general, that if the client trusts you with their life savings, the money they hope to use for their children's education or when they are old age retirement, you shouldn't mess up the money. Put the client interest first. And it's part of the culture. Okay, I'm now coming to the last uh, main segment of my talk today, which is to address the persistent concerns whether the value investing concept is in fact in a crisis. This uh, idea has come about uh, for many reasons, especially the global financial crisis of uh, 2008. I think we are seeing a breakdown in free market capitalism. I'll explain more what I mean. Now, some of you may not agree with this concept. That's okay. These are only my personal opinions and feel free to disagree. But in my view, the, uh, the free market principles of the capitalist system that I grew up with is breaking down before my eyes. Uh, there is a breakdown in the all important price discovery mechanism. Market prices have been distorted by excessive intervention uh, by the authorities and uh, by uh, central banks, by, by government deciding which industries will succeed and which will fail. Uh, there is a wave of uh, populist politics by politicians anxious to get votes on people. So they will go down and down and down in terms of uh, the, the standards of the society. And uh, capitalism is becoming more about bubble economics, money printing and uh, excessive stimulus, excessive debts, postponing our problems to the future generation so that we can survive today. There's also, of course, uh, uh, a retreat from globalization that has served the world so well uh, in the last uh, roughly 20 to 30 years of our lives. Uh, and also, I'm very suspicious of the growth of uh, passive investing, exchange traded funds, and other uh, methods of investing that involve uh, just, for me, index funds are funds that buy more when the price go up and sell more of a stock whose price is going down. It's the, to some extent, the opposite of what a value investor should be doing. So, all these uh, actions, etc., is uh, very uh, discouraging for me 
because it is beginning to uh, damage one of the key concepts of why uh, societies prosper and uh, the capitalist system actually works, which is the concept, it's, it's not here, I just my eye, the concept of creative destruction. The reason why uh, capitalist economies function well, one of the reasons, of course, is the price mechanism, which matches demand and supply at the optimum level and uh, eventually kills uh, excessive capacity, et cetera. Uh, the other is the concept of creative destruction. Many of you who study Economics 101 should be familiar with creative destruction. Uh, this simply means that companies that are unable to uh, be efficient and competitive should be allowed to fail. They should be allowed to go bankrupt. But in today's world, in many parts of the world, because of uh, government support, uh, zero interest rates or negative interest rates, and excessive money printing, and uh, frankly, free handouts, uh, even companies that are not particularly good are allowed to survive. And this is very destructive to value investor, you know, because we may be trapped too. You know, the market is no longer allowed to function freely. Uh, in order for society to regenerate itself and have a better tomorrow, we must allow companies and enterprises that are not competitive, we must allow them to go bankrupt. We must not support them because they will then have to be subsidized by the rest of us, either via government or other forms of subsidies. But since 2008, I have seen a uh, erosion of the creative destruction process that goes against every basic textbook that has ever been written about how economics really work. And this is very bad for value investors. The price discovery that we are expert at is no longer functioning very well. It seems sometimes that in our society today, it is not the fundamental investors with our research, our an analytics, and our professional skill that is finding out which companies win and which will lose, which stock go up and which stock goes down. It is actually governments and central bankers. And also as our society become monopolies, Hong Kong basically in, to some extent, whether it's banking, or even supermarkets, or airlines, or utilities, is run by monopolistic uh, cultures. A few companies dominate all these industries. It's actually unhealthy and not good for value investors. But these powerful interests, whether it's the government or monopolistic structures or central banks, seem to be more and more deciding who wins and who loses, rather than the free market, rather than fundamental and analysis and uh, value investors like us. We are losing the power to decide the winners and the losers. It is actually uh, not a good uh, situation for the future. And also uh, Anglo-Saxon style economies, especially in the last uh, generation, have become very financialized. Financialized means the financial system that I explained in the beginning is only a asset allocation process, allocating the savings of society to productive investments. But now the financial infrastructure has taken a, become a monster. It's called financialization, where it lives for the sake of living and generating wealth for the people inside it, rather than the real world. So in many societies now, giant financial companies are no longer allowed to fail, even when they don't succeed. Even when they mess it up, they will be rescued. So I think some, some people call it a funny one-way put, which is when times are good, financial companies make a lot of money for their executives and themselves. When times are bad, the government has to rescue them. So it's a no-win situation for our society. I don't agree with it. You know, I'm part of the financial industry, but I don't agree with it. Financialization has reached a point where according to estimates you may have read, which I've seen, financial claims and financial securities, that means paper, represent 5.5 times the amount of real assets in the world. It is a disaster. There's just too much paper and not enough real wealth to support it. Financialization also creates a situation where those who are rich are getting a lot richer. And those who don't own financial assets like stocks or real estate in Hong Kong, they miss out. There have been no in improvement in living standards, in real living standards, for example, in Hong Kong for at least 20 years. 
Yeah, I think that helps to explain the social unrest we've been experiencing. So I think with all these uh, unhappy ingredients, the global financial crisis we saw in 2008 could easily happen again. In my opinion, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, I hope not too soon though. And uh, in the next crisis, of course, the price earnings ratio that I like to talk about could go the other way. Instead of rising, it could simply crash while social and geopolitical tensions could uh, escalate. Another uh, unhealthy trend that we are witnessing is that the financial markets, the capital markets that we are, all, we are in, increasingly is characterized, characterized not by real investing anymore by people like me who follow fundamental research, but by people who treat it as a gaming or even gambling activity. I think we saw that with GameStop, but that is only the tip of the iceberg. Many participants in the capital market seem to have forgotten that the market exists solely to channel savings to productive investment, which is one of my favorite themes. They treat more like gaming, an extension of the uh, uh, internet gaming activities, or as a form of gambling, you know? And I think this is a total disaster. And, and unfortunately, it hurts the value investing guys like me who have no intellectual framework to try to figure out what these people are likely to do or not do. Because we are basically based on visiting real factories, real businesses, and trying to figure out how they are going to be able to produce great earnings and great dividends, right? Yeah. So uh, I think value investing must evolve, in, especially in the light of all this, both positive and negative factors we have seen since 2008, which was a defining moment for my generation. 2008 and the global financial crisis, the near collapse of giants like AIA and uh, the damaging setback to the credibility of the capitalist system was a defining moment for me. I like to think of my life as pre-2008 and post-2008. That's how serious it is to me. So we must evolve. We, the value investing fraternity, we must evolve and think about how we're doing our job. What are the tools available? And to me, it means it's not just a matter anymore of finding individual cheap stocks. It's also a, a, a challenge to construct a quality portfolio. We are evolving from finding cheap stocks to finding good quality businesses, good quality people. And then from there, we're evolving to construct entire portfolios based on uh, diversification across stocks, asset classes, and even markets. Yeah, it's, a different, it's defensive, it is uh, very skill consuming, and it requires an intellectual understanding of reality that goes beyond simple analysis. And the chance of error is also much higher. And also we had to blend in thematics. The reason for this is that as central bankers, political leaders, and uh, internet investment manias through the world, well, rule the world is too strong a word, but create a lot of action in the world, we have to be aware of what themes they love, what themes they hate. We don't necessarily have to buy into their themes, but it definitely is a very big influence on market outcomes. So we must blend in, blend in those themes. And uh, we have to uh, continue to uh, follow our dedication and uh, obedience to the principle of fundamental analysis. Despite all, I still think in the end, you still come back to the uh, basic idea that uh, society has savings. Those savings must be invested in productive enterprises for the good of the people. I don't think we can get away from that no matter what we do. If we deviate too much from it, which is what we're doing today, you will come back, but probably after a a massive crash. So I still want to stick to my uh, honesty as an intellectual investor of seeking truth from facts. I think with the uh, situation we are seeing in the world today, including the media where I used to work, uh, there is no longer a, uh, a strong uh, devotion to seeking truth from facts. The days, now there's even a term in the United States called Alternative truth. Alternative truth actually is a polite way of saying telling lies, you know? So I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to be part of this alternative truth uh, movement. 
I want to seek truth of facts. It, what it implies from the, my, the remarks I make so far is that investment today requires knowledge of many things besides fundamental analysis and financial theory and economics. Investment today involves a deep knowledge of all the things that shape the hopes and the fears of society, including history, politics, culture, the sciences, the arts, everything. You know, there was this theory that somebody uh, tried to prove in uh, some university that uh, the length of a woman's skirts has a strong correlation with the direction of stock markets. When women's skirts are shorter, markets tend to go up. When it's longer, markets tend to go down. I looked at that with great interest and found that it's surprisingly true. You know? So there you are. The point is you have to know many different things. Uh, in fact, for me personally, I think a knowledge of history is very important to understanding the uh, behavior of stock markets. Human behavior and history is a critical skill, at least for me. So I want to now move on to the concept of making value investment work globally, going beyond what I was taught in the 1980s, that value investing is about bottom-up stock picking. My first books in uh, value investing, uh, which I read in the late 1970s by John Train, uh, The Money Masters, was all about individual investment gurus, even at that time, including John Templeton, Warren Buffett, who focused on bottom-up stock picking. Templeton also focused on uh, markets too. But I think today, we have to evaluate an entire market, an entire country from a quality value perspective not just the individual sectors or individual stocks. I think market bubbles in recent years, bubble economics, uh, stocks going up, not based on fundamentals, but on the money creation and et cetera, have disguised rising problems in many countries. You will be foolish to ignore those problems and pretend they don't exist. On the contrary, it's up to each value investor to construct an overall portfolio, taking a very global approach that emphasizes quality and diversification and of course value investing. And in my opinion, again, I emphasize, you don't have to agree with me, uh, China, the Chinese stock market is one, one of the asset classes that should be overweighted in such a quality portfolio. And I will now explain why I think that way. First of all, of course, the Chinese market, I think still offers a potential, a potential catalyst for PE multiple re rating now it is trading at a PE of 1.5, about 15, with a 2% dividend yield, which is actually not cheap, but it's reasonable. It's reasonable. A few good things happen could create a PE multiple re-rating, which is what I'm looking for. And also, I think China offers a clear advantage in social stability, political stability, and financial discipline. We saw during the last... Uh, 12 to 24 months, 18 months of COVID, that while many countries, including Europe and the United States, engage in massive and excessive stimulus, uh, including uh, very low interest rates, very high debts, uh, a subsidy scheme for all sorts of companies and people, the Chinese side was very, very restrained. China's uh, stimulus was much lower and they had been much quicker to uh, withdraw the stimulus because their emphasis is on stability, uh, not necessarily just on uh, making things work from one year to the next. The result has been, uh, in my view, a, uh, a system in China that is inherently more stable. China, in my view, is already moving towards a form of capitalism called stakeholder capitalism, which is what I think will be the future. In Hong Kong and uh, large parts of the Western world, the form of capitalism that has been practiced uh, it's called shareholder capitalism. Companies, despite token efforts and philanthropy, basically are run to increase earnings per share and compensation, compensation for the executives. And also characterized by what to me is very short-term thinking. Rightly or wrongly, that's the system. In China, uh, whether you uh, agree or not, to me, they are taking a more uh, comprehensive view of the capitalist system that the free, they call it, I think, I think they call it something like uh, market economics or some, some term like that. 
uh, mixed ownership reform, etc. at least in the English language. But what they really mean is that companies exist not only to serve their shareholders, there's a wider constituency of stakeholders, including the public, including their customers, including their, uh, their staff. Uh, and I think this stakeholder uh, capitalism will also come to Hong Kong and other parts of the world. It makes sense because it makes for a more sustainable system that can last for the generations to come. Yeah. So, and also, of course, we have, uh, oh, 1979 to now, we have now uh, maybe 40 years of an economic miracle in China. Chinese economic growth now contributes 30%, 30% of global economic growth. That's a very big number. They have, uh, by last year, been able to eliminate extreme poverty in China, which is an incredible achievement. Up to the early 1960s, there were still people starving in China. Remember the Great Leap Forward, people starve. So this is a country that has somehow managed to eliminate uh, poverty or at least extreme poverty. Yeah, nobody starves anymore. Basics are all there. And they now have uh, one of the greatest blessings you need in global economics today, their own domestic market. Because at the moment, we are not too worried about demand. I mean, let me try again. We are not too worried about supply. Basically, the world has a lot of supply in many categories of goods and services. We are worried about demand. Where is the demand coming from? China has got a huge domestic market now. In some respects, it's really overtaken the, the biggest domestic market, the US. In other respects, it's catching up. But having a great domestic market, what I call having a demand chain, is critical if you want to be a great economy. Yeah. Demand chain means you have a market big enough to allow for economies of scale, allow for world-class research and innovation, allow for world-class building of brands. That's all available now on the mainland of China. And that is a, a big part of why I think that there is a continuing to be a catalyst for PE multiple re-rating. Last but not least is this interesting phenomenon where up to now, most of the savings of the Chinese people, one of the world's largest pools of savings, have been invested in bank deposits and in property. The Chinese government is trying to encourage people not to put so much money into property. They have imposed a lot of restrictions on who can buy and who can trade property. So recently, since last year, we are seeing a shift, a very important shift in Chinese household savings into the stock market. As of right now, less than 10% of Chinese uh, savings is in stocks. But the, as the number increases, you will see a uh, massive buying support for China-related stocks, not just in Shanghai and Shenzhen, but through Stock Connect in Hong Kong as well. And it's also, it's also interesting that because China has through capital controls and other types of uh, restrictions have been somewhat isolated from Western uh, financial markets, the old style value investing to a significant extent still actually works in mainland China. You can see here that uh, this is one of many exhibits I can show you that actively managed funds, not passive funds, active funds like the type I manage, persistently and consistently outperform the indices in China. We are still able to deliver alpha excess returns to our clients because the Chinese market is still relatively uh, a less developed market where the guy who has more research, more professional knowledge, and uh, more dedication to fundamental investing can still do a better job than your normal uh, Mr. Wong or Mr. Lee who is just playing the market. They are at disadvantage. I don't know how long this will last, but I hope for many more years to come. Okay, it's time to summarize and then uh, I think professor will call for a short break. Uh, we started our journey as a value investor. Our firm started in uh, 1993. I myself started in the 1980s. And our basic philosophy was buy low, sell high. Very easy. We were generating an average return after fees in those days of 15%, 1, 5% per annum to client. So the clients love us. We love ourselves. It was very stable. Today's style though has changed because of all the changes and uh, uh, I would call structuring changes that have happened, structural changes. Today we call ourselves buy right, sit right, blend in. That's our theory now. 
is much more difficult to execute. It requires a lot of judgment. Today's value investor is not really a number cruncher anymore. He doesn't just crunch numbers to make a, a nice living. Today's value investor is actually a judge. We always say, imagine you are like a high court judge in Hong Kong and the case come before you. And based on the balanced probabilities, you have to decide whether the guy is innocent or guilty. Innocent, you have to set him free. Guilty, you have to send him to jail. This is the same thing now in buying stocks. We are trying to decide whether the stock is a buy or a sell. Go to jail or set him free. It's a matter of uh, expert evaluation and frankly speaking, good, strong character and very deep knowledge across many different disciplines. But of course, the ratio analysis, the traditional number analysis is still very important because by looking at the companies, uh, for example, return on equity, uh, pricing power, cash flow analysis, it can help you a lot in deciding the quality of the company. And that, so you have to exercise judgment to emphasize the, the right business run by the right people. And then beyond that, try to figure out which are the markets that have the best value, asset classes, markets, and you have to consider also uh, the economic, social, political, and in my case, even historical factors that will allow you to make an educated judgment about where things are likely to be. Uh, I used to have an exercise because I was trained initially as a journalist where I try to imagine what the newspaper headlines in let's say South China Morning Post or Wall Street Journal or Financial Times, what the headlines will look like six, 12 and 24 months from today. You can guess it right. You can imagine the newspaper headlines. Then you have a much stronger case to decide whether the case before you is innocent or guilty. Yeah. For example, let's say, what will be uh, the headline in, uh, let's say, Hong Kong Economic Times or Hong Kong Economic Journal 12 months on today about Hong Kong? Uh, I am hoping you will say something like uh, Hong Kong stage dramatic recovery from two years of recession. That should, I hope, be at least part of the headlines 24 months on today. Could be wrong, could be right, but it's your job to try to make an educated judgment. And then, of course, you want to never forget your fundamental training when you're a young analyst, that is don't overpay, stick to fundamental analysis. Yeah.